Jesus, we, we just uh, sang such powerful words that is reminded of the freedom that we have in you. Lord, no matter what worries that we have, no matter what struggles that we have, uh, you're bigger than those. And so, Jesus, we, we want to say thank you. We want to be able to be reminded as we are in your presence of who you are. Because when we are reminded in your presence of who you are, it radically changes our perspective on what we see in our life and the world around us. And so, Jesus, we want to make that blow declaration that you are the true king that sits upon the throne. And you have power, you have authority. Everything is in your hand. And we simply today want to come under that authority. We want to yield ourselves to what you are doing. Because, Jesus, we know you are moving. You are actively working. Holy Spirit, we know that you are present and you are actively moving. And now we just simply want to put ourselves in a position in which we yield to what you're doing in our life. And so, Jesus, we, we ask that you remove uh, any distractions from our mind and our heart, preventing from hearing you. God, that the, you remove all the fears that we may have, preventing us from responding to you. And so just simply come and have your way today. God, I pray for myself, may I not simply be a speaker of your word, because, God, you know, that is just so easy. But I long for your word to be real and acted out in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's uh, something strange about being a parent. You all of a sudden get a wake-up call when you have children. Um, I don't know how God does it. It's almost kind of all of a sudden when your child is born and you're holding the baby in your hand, you're not going, oh, there's such a cute baby. You're going, oh, my goodness, what did I get myself into? Right? The first thing that comes out of your mind is all the fears. Now, now you got to really put on your pants and, and do some work. Now, now this is real. There's no more playing around. I, I can't have toys anymore. I, the only toys that I'm going to be buying are their toys. You come to this full realization that there are a lot of things that you got to learn how to do. And over the last few years, I, I've learned a lot of things about being a parent. I've learned how to change diapers with one hand. I've learned not to be disgusted by different smells that comes out of diapers or different colors or different forms the liquid or solid state that comes out of diapers. I also realize that uh, I'm very familiar with the playground. I, I, I know what's free to go to. I, I know when to take care, take my children to different places. I know also this understanding of schedules and routine. But as I became a parent and as I began to go through these things about being a parent and raising children, I realized something about my own personal life. I realized I had none of those things. I grew up as a child of an immigrant. And so my parents never took me to the playground. They never took me to McDonald's. To this day, I'm still waiting for my father to fulfill his promise that he will take me to McDonald's and buy me a Happy Meal. Right? I remind him that, and he says, you have money, go yourself. So all these things, I never, all I remember was this, that as a child growing up, my parents were working, and I sat in front of a TV. Uh, they didn't encourage me to do chores. Uh, they didn't say I needed to be responsible of anything. I just sat in front of a TV, and I watched TV. I used to joke around and say all of my teachers were on TV. You know, I learned my moral lessons uh, from a different stroke. I learned how to grow up through, you, you, you know, growing pains. I, I watched the cartoons, G.I. Joe, to learn my moral values of how not to lie and cheat and always play fair. I learned all of those things through TV. And as I grew older, then my parents had expectations of me that I needed to somehow be responsible. Now, as I became a teenager, and then as I began to become an adult, they were like, you need to clean up your room. They, uh, you need to wash the dishes. You need to do your own laundry. You need to do all these things because they are important for you. I grew up not having any responsibilities. In fact, I grew up not really having any parental guidance at all. And all of a sudden, my parents expect that just simply by them saying to me that you need now to have all these responsibilities, that somehow I was going to do it. Right? It's funny, isn't it? I think that we have a similar situation in churches today. 
you know, you, get, you hear the pastors get up and, and, and talk about how people should be involved in church, how they should be involved in the kingdom, how they should serve God. But we have a similar situation because likewise, what we teach people on a Sunday is just simply to come and sit down. Just come and sit down. And if you come and sit down, if you listen, then you should know everything. And therefore, because you now know everything, therefore now you should be able to do something with all the things that you know. But likewise, when I grew up, my parents would tell me all these things, why you should wash dishes, why you should learn how to cook, why you should do all these things, that'll be good for you. All these responsibilities will be good for you. But the problem is, I never own them. And I think for many of us in churches today as well, we, we hear about the importance of, of, of the kingdom of God. We hear about the importance uh, of understanding that we want to usher in the kingdom of God. We, we want to join in with what God is doing in this world, and many of us, we get excited about it. We, we hear stories, and we say, yeah, that's great. I, I love the idea of this, but I just can't seem to move myself to do it. And the problem is, is because it isn't that we do not know. The problem is that we have an ownership issue. We don't own what we believe. And if you and I want to have a global awakening of what God is doing in this world, then it's going to require for us to have ownership for his kingdom. Right? Today, I, I kind of want us to take a look at a very familiar passage, um, but from a different perspective. Please look with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through verse 20. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every, in every, any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet, it was good of you to share in my troubles. However, as you Philippians know, in the early days of my acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the manner of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once, when I was in need. Not that I desire your gift. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amp supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God, and Father, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We know this passage very well. Uh, we know verse 13 very well. Uh, most of us quote it. We, uh, we know it by heart. And this is, some of us, it's our life verse. But I kind of want to take a look at a different take from this passage. Instead of looking at the perspective of Paul, I want us to take a look at the perspective of the believers in the church in Philippi. Uh, we know that the circumstances that Paul was in, he was in prison in Rome, and here it is, he's locked up, nobody remembers him except the believers in Philippi. Not only did they remember him, um, but they sent Epaphroditus to take care of him, to physically watch over him. Now, most of us would think, well, what does that matter? Well, in the Roman times, when you're in jail, there's no food. There ain't jail in like, America where you get three square meals, exercise, you get to breathe, and, you know, you get TV, you get comp time. Ain't none of that. You are alone. You are locked up, and food, the only way you're getting food is somebody's providing for you, bringing it to you every single day. And so this is the circumstances that Paul is in. And when the church and the believer in, in, in Philippi, they, they realize that this was Paul's condition, uh, they basically put their resources together, and sent it with Epaphroditus to take 
care of Paul. It's such an interesting perspective to see this because uh, this church, the believers in Philippi gave Paul so much joy. It overwhelmed them because to see that believers understood first and foremost what he was called to, understood the sacrifices that he made for the kingdom of God to expand the kingdom of God and for their desire to partner with Paul in expanding the kingdom of God. Most of us know that we're part of a family of churches called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and we believe in the fourfold gospel plus another logo, right? We know Christ as our Savior, our coming King, our, our healer, and our sanctifier. But there's a glow behind it. If you didn't know, you could take a look at the logo later. Right? There's a glow behind it. It's like a, a, a picture of a world behind it. And that is to complete the mission of Christ. To say that is basically saying that we as a family of churches, we believe that we, ha we have to take ownership in completing the mission of Christ. That we have to, it's our responsibility. It's no one else's. It belongs to us sitting in this room, to everyone else, all the believers across the world. It is our responsibility. This is what we believe. We believe that it is our responsibility to complete the mission of Christ. And so last week we said this, there needs to be a sense of urgency when it comes to having a global awakening. Well, this week I'd like to challenge us and say that we need to have ownership when it comes to a global awakening because the completion of Christ's mission does not fall on me does not just fall on you. It falls on every single one of us. But, I mean, if you've been in church long enough, you will realize that uh, you know how the game goes because eventually you figure out the system of how things operate. If you've been in church long enough, you know all you need to do is just come. You sit, listen, say a few nice words, and if you actually like the people there, you, you might actually spend a little more extra time with them. You, you, you might even join one of their fellowship groups, or nowadays they call it life groups, right? Uh, or if, if you're really involved and, and you feel compelled by wanting to take care of, of the church, you, 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 you might want to, you might even pull out something from your wallet every Sunday here and there. And, and if you're really like, oh, I am on fire for God, then you might actually get involved by maybe sweeping the floor or, <laughs> you know, being a part of the children's ministry or, or serving in some way, capacity, most likely the worship team, because everybody wants to be on the worship team, right? <laughs> in some way, shape, or, or, or capacity. And, and, and then we feel like, yes, I am a part of completing the mission of Christ. I am a part of, of, of what God is doing in this world. I have news for you. The answer is no. The answer is no. We are not a part of completing the mission of Christ. Because the mission of Christ doesn't exist in here. The mission of Christ exists out there. Right? Somehow, like I said, we, we, we have this crazy idea that people in this world have FOMO about church, going to church. That somehow if we invite them into church, that they're going to like it because we, we have some, you know, great preaching. That's what they say that grows church. You know, you got to have a great preacher. Uh, Right? Worship team, right? You know, you, you got to have welcoming things that cause people to be welcome to come in. And we actually believe that we had all these things that people that, that are outside of the four walls of this church will have FOMO because we have those things and they will actually want to come because they won't want to miss out. That's not true. That does not complete the mission of Christ. To complete the mission of Christ, it means first and foremost that we have to take ownership because this is what the believers of Philippi did. They took ownership because they recognized what Paul was doing, first and foremost. They recognized that he was on missions for God, and not only was he on missions for God, but he was in chains because of that mission, that he was suffering because of that mission. And you know what? Because they had the sense of ownership, they were willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that Paul can be a part of that and that they can partner with Paul. That's an amazing understanding of ownership. Because most of us, when we think of ownership, <laughs> we really don't think about ownership. We don't really know what that even means. 
Because most of us think that when we have ownership, it means that I have rights to that property. I own it, and I can do whatever I want with it. Right? I could choose to ignore it. I could choose to do something about it. Everybody just needs to leave me alone. But when we understand about ownership, we understand this, that that is a part of me, and I need to take care of it. Whatever I put into it is whatever I'm going to get back out of it. Right? To understand ownership specifically and understanding about completing the mission of Christ is this. You actually have to be concerned, right? Look at what Paul says in verse 10. He says, I'm so glad that you have renewed the concern for me. That there's a renewing, that there's an awakening of concern for it. And I, I would say this, when it comes to the mission of Christ, and when it comes to completing the mission of Christ, most of us as Christians are not concerned. We could care less because the only thing we care about is what can God do for me? How can God answer my prayers and give me my goods? When we think about the church, all we care about is what, can, what is the spiritual religious goods that the church can provide me? Give me, give me, give me. As a church, we don't exist to provide people with religious spiritual goods. We exist. We exist to partner with God, to usher in his kingdom. And that requires ownership. And ownership starts with being concerned. How do you even become concerned about something? It first has to be in your thoughts. You got to actually think about it. And not only does it, do you think about it, you actually wrestle with it. You, you, you wrestle about what the outcome may be, and then you begin to, be, you begin to feel something about it. There's, there's an emotional component to it as well. And, and if you're concerned about something, we often act upon it. To have ownership means it has to be in our mind. We have to think about it. We have to feel it. And we have to do something about it. That's ownership. I mean, quite honestly, I don't think most of us spend time thinking about like, oh, I don't think my neighbor knows Christ. You know, I, I hear them argue, maybe they need Jesus. So we're just going to tell them, you know, they, they need to shut up because my kids are sleeping. That's most of our thoughts. Or we don't think about what's wrong about neighbor, what's going on. We, we, don't even, we don't go in prayer walk. We don't even go and ask who, who our neighbors. We don't even know who our neighbors are. I mean, the greatest thing about not being concerned about things and not feeling guilty about it is ignorance. Ignorance is bliss. If you're, not concerned, if you're ignorant about something, guess what? You don't have to worry about it. It doesn't bother you. But the reality is this. You and I cannot be a family on mission if we have no concern for completing the mission of Christ. This is who we are as a church. This is our heartbeat. And it starts with, with a simple concern. Because when we begin to be concerned about something, guess what happens? We begin to be creative about what we can do about it. We no longer think about the limitations that we have, right? Because most of the time, we always worry about, oh, huh, what can we do? I, I'm just one person. Or what can our church do? We're, we're just a church of few. But when we're concerned about something, we begin to be creative in how we address the concern. We begin to be creative. We begin to think about different ways in, in, in which how we can participate and how we can partner with Christ. It's amazing. But if you and I aren't creative, it will mean that we're not concerned. Because then we'll often say, 
yeah, that's great. I want to see God's kingdom take this, but I have limitations. I have kids. They need to sleep. I, 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 I want to see the kingdom of God, but my spouse isn't on board. I, 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 I want to see the kingdom of God, but I work too many hours. But when there's a deep concern, then we learn how to be creative. We learn how to be creative. We learn how to find time. We learn how to find resources. We learn how to get people on board. We learn how to do it with other people. We learn not to only just do it, but we learn to begin to be a spokesperson, to be a champion. For it. We begin to give a voice to the concern. And I don't know, maybe that's what took place in, in the church of Philip because they knew Paul. They knew him very well, and they loved him. And at this junction in Paul's life, there was nobody that was concerned for him anymore. There were, people weren't even concerned for his mission anymore. Right, people were basically slandering his character, telling that this Paul is crazy, he's a nobody. But here it is. The believers in Philippi were concerned, and they found a creative way to support Paul. They gathered their resources together. They sent someone there to make sure that Paul is physically being taken care of, that his needs are met. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, I don't need this because I have come into a season of my life where I know that God can do anything and everything and God will take care of me. But the heart of the believers in Philippi reveals so much and why he loved them so much. Because they want to be a part of completing the mission of Christ. So what are, what are you and I concerned about today in our life? What concerns us? A career? A better career? Health? Marital stability? A spouse? Yeah, it's okay to admit that. It's okay to say that we worry about that. But we also need to be concerned about the kingdom. As diligently as you and I put our prayers and lift them up to Jesus for him to alleviate, to fix, to do whatever, I think we should also spend the same amount of diligence in prayer in asking about his kingdom. To be concerned about his kingdom will move us into action. It will move us into action. You and I can just play the church game. Come, sit in the pews. And we're, you know, we're good Christians. We don't complain. We tithe and we be a part of all the church activities and functions. That doesn't mean that we're on mission with God. Because on mission with God is an individual mandate. It is an individual mandate. You don't just tag along. It's an individual concern. So we can go on and play the church game and just sit in the pews and get our religious goods and say our hallelujahs and amen and say that Jesus is good all the time. We can do that. Then let nothing happen. Or we can awaken from our slumber. begin to embrace 
ownership of completing his mission. It starts with a little spark. And that spark is being concerned. Because when we're concerned, it's in our mind. It's on our thoughts. And when something is in our thoughts, it will begin to move into our hearts. And then when it begins to move into our hearts, then we'll be convicted, we'll be motivated to actually wanting to do something about it. And that is ownership. You know, it's hard to, for most of you to believe, but I used to be very lazy. Right? Most of you look at me like, oh, wow. He gets a lot of things done. He's you know, able to do a lot of things. Hard to believe, but I used to be very lazy. I used to sit on the couch, watch TV. I still sit on the couch, watch TV. It's just I'm more effective than sitting down and watching TV. I used to not care about cleaning. I used to, as Candace would affectionately put it, is I like to hoard boxes. I don't throw it, I just leave the boxes there. You know, hey, you know, I read, don't throw it out. Um, not just that, and my table is what I call control chaos. My desk is control chaos. If you touch it, you move it, oh my goodness, you just rock my world because I know exactly where I put my stuff. So if you move it, I don't know where it is. So I used to be very lazy, not responsible. My parents used to yell at me because when I was an adult, they are like, why don't you go mow the lawn? I don't want to. Why don't you go clean up your apartment? I don't want to. Why don't you do your laundry? Because I don't want to. Right? But why do you do that? Why, do you, why can't you drive me that? I don't want to. But somehow when I began to, take a, I began to take ownership over my own life, and like I said, when I had kids, you had this, oh my goodness moment. Okay? It, it, it's time to grow up. Right? <laughs> because you, you looked at the child and you're like, oh my goodness, your life is over. Right? You can't say, I don't want to do this anymore. Right, because there isn't. I don't want to do it. You have to. You don't want to wake up too bad. You have to. You you don't want to cook too bad. You have to. That's when I began to learn ownership. That's when I began to realize I had responsibilities that I had to take care of, even if I didn't want to take care of. You know, my, now my parents will, every time here and there when we're at family functions, my mom would sarcastically say to my brother and my sister, look at your brother. You see how he takes care of the house? Look at what he does. He cleaned the dish. Look, he even built that. He took care of his yard. Right? Look at He knows how to fix little things. What about you? What about you? Why can't you be like your brother? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I began to understand a sense of ownership. When I began to be a homeowner, I realized, oh my goodness, I got to take care of my own stuff. All right? I, 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 I got to shovel my own snow. Oh, my... Parents used to yell at me, why don't you shovel the snow? It's like, you're a big guy. Why don't you do it? Are you so lazy? Now it's like, I don't even need to be asked. I just go out and shovel because guess what? My car ain't going out of the driveway if I don't do it. Because if I do not physically be a part of it, it's not going to happen. That's when you know you have ownership over something. That's when you know that we're, we're taking ownership over something. Yes. We really don't want to complete the mission of Christ. It's okay to admit it. We don't want to. It's not convenient. It makes us feel awkward. It makes us feel afraid. It makes us feel like we're fish out of water. It's okay to say that I really don't want to do it. But we will do it, even if we don't feel like it. Because that's when you know you take ownership of something. So 
if you and I want to complete the mission of Christ, it's going to require ownership in each and every single one of us. I know. I don't want to. But I have to. Because that's the only response I can give to Christ. That's the only response that is worthy enough for the love that he has for me. Over the summer, I, I, I learned something. I realized that I used to do a lot of things simply because I want accolades and I, I want people to like me and, and I want to be popular, I want to be a superstar. And over the summer, as I reflect on a lot of things, you know, God asked me, why am I doing all of this? Why are you church planting? Why are you doing all of this? Why are you walking away from comfort? Why are you doing all this? Why are you putting yourself in that situation? And I even ask God, why, why am I doing this? It's simple. Because I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, the only response I can adequately give to him in response of the love I have for him is obedience. And guess what? I don't want to be on mission. I'd rather be on fishing on a boat. I don't want to be on mission. I don't want to worry about other people. I just want to worry about me. I don't want to pray for other people. I just want to pray for myself. I don't want to hear about other people's problems. I want other people to hear about my problems. I don't want to, but guess what? I love Jesus. And the only response that I can give to him that is worthy of the love that he has for me and the love I have for him is obedience. And if I want to be obedient to Christ, when it comes to completing his mission, I need to take ownership. I need to take ownership. It's on me. I do not need to worry about what other people are not doing. I just simply need to be concerned about what I'm doing myself. Am I, as an individual, taking ownership of completing his mission? Because that mandate isn't for Envision Church, the organization. It is for Envision Church, for every single person who sits in these seats. Let's take ownership. Let's start being concerned of our community, of our neighborhood. Let's start being concerned. Let's start thinking about them. Let's start feeling for them. So after I said all this, I expect all of you to be there next Saturday. Right? I see you all next Saturday there. It starts with that. Just simple concern. God knows I don't want to neither. I'd rather sleep in. But who wants to stand out of the cold? No one. Because we are concerned. Because we are obedient to Christ. And we want to see his mission be completed. That's why we're here. And invite the worship team to come up. It's time for an awakening to the reality of the world that we live in. God has brought every tribe, every nation, every people group, closer. He has separated the distance. Long Island has drastically changed. The people groups are also here. And so we need awakening. We need to be awakened his mission. We need to take ownership of that mission. We 
need to be concerned about his mission. We, not, we need to begin to start feeling for his mission. And we need to start taking action. And so, maybe as Dave is leading us in a time of response, maybe just between you and God, ask yourself this simple question. This are all the things that you're concerned with right now in your life. And then ask yourself this simple question. Do you believe in what Paul believed? That with God all things are possible. That I'm content. That God will provide. That God will take care of me. to that realization that God will take care of those concerns. Now then we can shift our concern to his mission. Completing his mission. We don't have to get it all right in our life to be a part of his mission. But we need to be concerned and we need to get to take steps. So as Dave is leading us in a time response just between you and God, easy sometimes to simply be so fixated on certain things. And that uh, because we're fixated on certain things, we can never see the bigger picture. And I feel like uh, the reason why some of us are being prevented from fully embracing the bigger picture of Christ, uh, the bigger picture of a community is mission is we're so fixated. We're so fixated on our